o'clock and we're going to call to order tonight's meeting of the Crystal Environmental Quality Commission. Um, my name is Terry Schultz. I'm the current chair of the commission and we're going to start off tonight with a presentation about living with urban wildlife with Tom Mahan from uh, who's the animal control officer. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, something that's always been a big interest to me, wildlife. Um, so I am the animal control officer for New Hope in Crystal. I've been in the job for 23 and a half years now. Um, the position goes back way to the early 70s, this joint New Hope Crystal um, thing. And it's worked out pretty well for both cities. So I split my time patrolling and, and going on calls for service to both cities, uh, primarily animal related calls. Um, so um, I've been working with animals for probably about 45 years now. I've got my degrees in biology and, and also wildlife has always been my life, essentially, um, all the way till now. Let's hope this, and it's not working. Stand by <laughs> right now. Let the reset. There we go. All right, so um, it's a pretty well-developed uh, older city. We actually have a very diverse uh, array of animals that live in our city. Um, before our cities were here, there was a good diversity with even more animals. Um, and then we converted that land to our needs, to farmland and to cities. Um, and once the city aged and the vegetation cover aged and got bigger, the trees grew up, we put in more shrubs, those kinds of things. Um, a lot of the animals started to come back. A lot of the animals also responded to things that we throw out in our yards, our garbage. Uh, we create homes for them in our backyard. So, um, but we do have a pretty good array of animals that live here. Um, I thought I'd start out by running through, uh, especially the mammals. Um, a lot of the calls that I go on, uh, people don't understand what they actually have in their yard, uh, the species, and sometimes they're misidentified. And what to do with those, uh, the issues that are going on are very species specific. So I thought I'd run through a few things. One of the most popular ones for some people are the raccoons. Um, the masked bandits are sometimes called. Um, their population has been doing quite well with human population. They've adapted quite well to all the changes we've made to the, to the environment. Um, they are generalists. They'll eat anything they can get a hold of. Um, they'll raid garbage cans. They'll find duck eggs. They'll um, uh, feel around the water for crayfish, so just about anything. Um, they're very hardy little beasts. Um, their range has been spreading um, pretty much as our range spread throughout the United States. Um, and they're actually now moving into Canada much more than, than uh, before. Um, they are primarily active at night. Um, there is a theory out there that they actually, actually didn't always used to be like that. They used to be more diurnal or active during the day, but um, in reaction to us being around more, uh, they actually switched to being more active at night. So right now that's pretty much their, their situation. So if you see one during the day, uh, we do tell people to call just in case there's some, might be something wrong with it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, for the most part, they love to be in dens, an enclosed area, a cavity. So tree cavities, a chimney on a, on a building, under a deck, under a shed, something like that. And really hot weather like this, they might actually just be up in the crotch of a tree spending the day. Um, so that wouldn't really constitute being out in the daylight if they're up there sleeping in the crotch of a tree. Um, but I do get calls um, to come out and check raccoons that are just sleeping out there. Um, but a hot, humid day like this, they are gonna suffer just like we would when they have a fur coat. Um, so they're gonna be out where uh, they can get some nice breeze on them. Um, they do have a litter per year, generally three to five young. Uh, the male doesn't have anything to do with raising, it's all the females. Um, and they would be typically the ones that are in those cavities, in those dens, in the chimney, perhaps, with the young. Uh, because the young have to be protected um, for a few weeks until they're big enough to follow mom around to go hunt. Um, some of the signs of the raccoons in our area, uh, that guy in the upper left in the bucket was actually pulled out of a 55-gallon drum of used cooking oil. Mm -hmm. I got called to the back of one of our restaurants here in the city for a raccoon. They didn't secure the lid of the 55 gallon drum. And again, raccoons are always looking for something to eat. So they lifted the lid of that drum and fell into a vat of cooking oil, um, old cooking oil. 
So we got them out of that. Uh, the ones in the middle or the upper right there are looking out from a chimney. Um, if you look to the right, the cover to the right is what it should look like, the cover on the chimney. It should have nice solid um, metal mesh around it to keep things out. Somehow either it didn't have one or they ripped it out or it rotted out, that could be, um, and went into that chimney. So those are the young ones there. Um, the um, side window down below that raccoons can actually do a lot of damage. Um, I tend to see much of the damage though to older buildings, rotten wood, something that's easy for them to tear apart. They generally wouldn't go tearing apart solid wood, um, um, but they will again, take advantage of what we would give them. And so if we don't keep up the building well enough, they'll find that weakness and try to get in. So this is going into an attic. Um, another sign of, of raccoons is that promises is the only picture of scat or poop that I have in my presentation. Um, but I get a call a lot of come out and tell me what this stuff is in my yard. Um, but that is raccoon droppings. Um, it's very um, uh, uh, typical of raccoon. Uh, somehow they always get seeds, large seeds in their, their droppings. So you can always tell it's a raccoon that way. Whereas something like a fox that might have the same size would have- I mean, that was me would have um, <laughs> bones and fur of the animal, the predator or the prey that they've eaten. So um, one thing raccoons do is they mark their territories with their droppings. It's something that's called a latrine. So at the base of a tree, on a rooftop, uh, on the uh, area right around the house, they'll put a lot of droppings in one place to mark their territory. Um, so I do get calls periodically for that as well. Uh, one thing to do with that is to eliminate it and cover it with rags soaked in ammonia because they don't like the ammonia smell and that might throw them off enough to, to move elsewhere. Uh, so those are raccoons, another favorite of some people and, and the bane of others is the Eastern gray squirrel. Um, these are our two our true tree squirrels um, and are uh, active both in the trees and on the ground, uh, very acrobatic um, and again, um, these animals are much smarter than we want them to be, and squirrels can always figure out where the food is and where they can go, um, and it, it does take a lot to outsmart them. Um, they are mostly active during the day, they're diurnal, um, and they eat primarily plant material. Um, I say herbivore mostly um, because they do raid uh, bird nests. They might eat a young bird or an egg if they can get it, um, but for the most part, they're they're um, herbivores and are actually, in the ecological sense, they're a big part of this because they will spread the seeds of trees um, and help to disperse those from, um, from the, uh, the tree that's dropping those seeds. They, they do scatter those seeds because they're active throughout the year moving those around. Um, they do like to uh, build nests in the trees, uh, either cavity or the big, everybody has seen the big leaf nests up in the trees. Um, but they will get into chimneys, they will get into attics too. And again, they will take advantage of, of rotten wood, open doors, anything that they can get into because the house is this a big cavity for them. Um, they are pretty prolific. They do have a couple litters a year, um, um, but their lifespan is not very long. So it's kind of tempered by having a lot of young. Um, some of the signs of, of the squirrel are that big leaf nest, either way out in the end of the branches or in the crotch of the tree. Um, I get a lot of calls for squirrels that have chewed on garbage cans. Um, again, if they can get in there, they will try to eat what's in those cans so they can smell it and they will try to get to it. Um, they are rodents, their front incisors are always growing. So they always are chewing on something um, to keep those incisors down. So. Um, the garbage cans, or you can see in the bottom picture, the chewing into the side of the, out of the house. And that was uh, some rotten wood. It was easy for them to get up onto that building and to chew through that. So, so the gray squirrels, uh, something else around here that people don't really see too often unless you are out at night. This is one of our truly nocturnal animals and always has been is the striped skunk. Um, they are not very good climbers. They tend to stay on the ground, but they will eat anything they come across on the ground. They will also roll up new lane sod to try to get at what they think might be down there. They might dig for grubs. They might um, find a bird nest on the ground. Um, they would eat garbage. They would get into a compost pile if they can, 
can. So anything they can get a hold of. Um, they love to get under decks and sheds if they can. Um, they do have one litter a year, but sometimes they can have a lot. I've counted as many as 12 baby skunks out with the mother one time. So um, they can be pretty prolific sometimes. Um, and of course, they're most famous for their defensive mechanism, which is the spray. Um, they are a member of the weasel family, so they've got some pretty good teeth and they can bite if they need to, but it's mostly that spray and that coloration that keeps um, other animals away. It's really the dumb dogs that don't know better um, that will get up and get sprayed or if somebody um, surprises them. They do give a warning, but a lot of people don't realize what the warnings are. They'll stomp the, the ground really fast. They'll stand up on their front paws, their front legs, and point their, their tail the direction that they want to spray. Um, again, all is a warning notice. Uh, they don't really, it's believed they don't really want to spray. Um, they just want to be left alone, essentially. So, um, but when they do spray, they can do it in two ways, either an aerosol, the whole hose, the whole area down, or very direct streams that can come out. And they do aim for the face and the eyes. Um, so they can be pretty good at, at doing that. So, but for the most part, they would rather move on and run away um, than to actually engage that. Um, an animal that, that is fairly new to North America, it was somewhat introduced into the, into the continent um, is the red fox. They're very well established throughout the, the United States now. Um, a lot of people do like to see them. Um, a lot of people misunderstand what they eat. They primarily are eating small animals, rodents, uh, rabbits, birds, things like that. They don't really go after dogs or cats um, uh, that some people believe in. Um, they can be active dusk or dawn. Uh, they can be active all during the day if they have kits to feed, hungry kits. Um, they will certainly be out hunting for those, and, uh, for those kits to keep them going. Um, they do dig burrows and they will choose that shed or deck if they can, or a big wood pile or the sandy slope of a, a, you know, a sloped area. Um, they have the one litter and the male and female both um, uh, contribute to raising the young. Um, when they're active at night and interacting with other fox, they can emit some pretty loud screams. If you go on, on the web and look up red fox screams or cries. Um, it's pretty eerie. And a lot of people will call me and say, I heard this animal suffering. And they, if they recorded it, they'll play it. And I said, nope, it's just a red fox making noise. Um, so um, if you're ever out and you hear weird screaming uh, noise, most likely it would be from a red fox. Um, and its cousin, the coyote, is making a, a major comeback in, in metro areas throughout the United States. Um, the coyote was persecuted for decades, even by the federal government, um, because it was feared they were eating livestock. Um, they will prey on livestock. Again, they are generalists, they're opportunistic, um, but they primarily are eating small animals as well. And they'll actually eat a lot of plant material too, um, um, when given the choice. So um, they are known for, for going after dogs, going after cats, um, especially if a dog wanders near uh, the burrow, uh, especially if they've got kits, um, they will defend it, um, um, thinking that dog is going to be bad news for them. Uh, the pack can be very vocal. Uh, most of us have probably heard coyotes, and, and sometimes the sirens from the fire engines will set them off in this area. Um, if you hear that, um, especially over around Gethsemane Cemetery over in New Hope. Um, they do follow what's left of natural corridors in our area are the railroad tra um, tracks, and they will follow those quite a bit. Their prey is down there, plus there's fewer people, um, so they will follow the railroad tracks quite a bit, and they'll end up in the commercial properties on the south end um, or um, around um, some of the more natural areas too. Um, they do have one litter a year. Um, if there is a pack, generally it's the alpha male, female that are breeding only and the rest are helping with, with the young. Um, and again, we did persecute them for years. And, and actually some studies found out that the higher the persecution is, the larger the litter size is going to be um, for that. So actually the more we were taking them out, they're actually producing a lot more uh, babies. So, um, so um, Lately, probably in the last decade or so, there's been a big move 
to try to re-educate urban coyotes <clears throat> to not really be around people <clears throat> or around things that we like, our, like our pets. Um, <clears throat> so a method of harassing them has been developed where you can yell at the coyote, throw things towards them, charge towards them, all in an effort to reteach them that they don't really want to be around us. Wildlife really doesn't want to interact with us. We don't have any animals around here that see us as a prey item um, or something that they really want to pick a fight with. Um, but they will approach and be curious and again, opportunistic. So by doing this harassment technique, we can actually retrain them. And this has been proven in, in radio collar studies um, where coyotes that were hanging around human uh, activities were harassed in those methods. And then within just a couple of, of uh, encounters with the harassment, they learned to stay away from people. So it does actually work. So I do encourage people to do that kind of thing. But if you see one out and about, <clears throat> they are active day or night. They can be, again, depending on if they're feeding young. Um, and it's not a serious threat. Just because you see one doesn't mean something bad's going to happen. So, but it might be a good time to do some harassment for to that coyote um, and just kind of reteach it. So that would work. <clears throat> a native to our continent, but so, somewhat new to our area is the opossum, the Virginia opossum. Some people call it a possum. <clears throat> the true possums actually live in New Zealand and Australia. Um, but here we have it is the Virginia possum. Um, they have migrated up from Central and South America um, and have done quite well. They are the only marsupial in our hemisphere. Uh, the female has a pouch. When the young are born, they're, they're, they're just tiny little bee-sized creatures. They don't even have hind legs. They crawl their way to the mother's pouch attached to a nipple and then spend the next several weeks attached to that nipple. Um, and when they're ready to come out of the pouch, they will cling on to the, to the mother. <clears throat> so that actually makes the opossums very uh, nomadic. They don't spend a lot of time in one area. They don't build a burrow. They usually will use a burrow of another animal. Um, they tend not to be destructive, like maybe a raccoon and rip their way into a house, um, um, but they can move around very well. Um, they do have opposable thumbs much like ours, so they can grasp things very well. They have a what's called a prehensile tail um, that they can um, help to balance in the trees. And they, I've actually seen some carrying leaves that way when they're actually creating a little nest in a burrow, they'll bring leaves into it by wrapping them up in their tail. Um, a lot of people don't like to look at them. They think they're ugly. They think they look like big rats. Um, I get called out a lot for a rat running in the yard and I get there and it's just an opossum. So they are probably the most benign animal out there, actually. You can practically pick them up. I wouldn't recommend anybody doing it, but anytime I've had to just pick them up to move them, they hiss and they open their mouth, but they don't try to bite. They actually have the most teeth of any North American mammal, too. So if they were to bite, they could bite pretty badly, but I've never had one actually bite me. <clears throat> so um, thank you very much. Losing my voice here. Um, since they came up from the south and they do have a lot of bare skin, they do suffer from frostbite a lot in our winters. They somehow make it through our winters though, um, but we do see a lot um, that do have missing ears, missing toes, missing parts of their tail. Um, so as long as it heals up well enough, it doesn't really bother them that much, but it's, it's something that can, can get to them. Their lifespan isn't very long, unfortunately. Um, but an odd thing that's been found out recently is they do actually have sort of a lower body temperature and a lot of diseases like rabies can't survive inside their body. Rabies, distemper, parvovirus, things that, are, that would attack other warm blooded animals um, don't seem to affect opossums very much. So they're not considered carriers of zoonotic diseases. That's something that we can get like rabies. Um, so I think they're great animals. I love opossums. Um, so they're pretty neat to have around, but a lot of people who grew up in Minnesota never saw them before. And I started seeing them and getting calls about them about probably close to 20 years ago now. So when they started showing up, so they're pretty, pretty well established now. And they eat ticks, right? They eat a lot of bugs. They are believed to, to eat a lot of ticks. Yes. Yeah. They'll eat just about anything they can get a hold of, but yes, they are known for eating ticks. Yep. Yeah. Um, the woodchuck or groundhog is one of our, our true um, 
ground squirrels. It's related to the marmot you would find in higher elevations out west. Um, these are tough little animals. They are sturdy little things. They dig burrows. Uh, they dig uh, a labyrinth underground uh, with all kinds of entrances and different chambers um, to live in. They are true hibernators. They go into uh, torpor uh, hibernation during the winter where their body temperature actually lowers and their heart rate slows. And um, they will spend the winter underground. Um, they love to dig it under decks and sheds if they can do it or under a wood pile. Um, they are plant eaters. Uh, they are exclusively herbivores. Um, and a lot of people don't like them because they do get into, if they get into a garden, they will eat a lot of things in the garden. So um, we'll talk about keeping them out. Um, they do have a, um, a, young, uh, a litter of four to six um, once a year. Some of the signs of a woodchuck being in your yard are digging. Um, anything that digs next to our buildings generally dig right at the edge of it. They'll start where the ground is soft or has been disturbed at one point. Um, and then they'll go right underneath it and under the deck, under the, under the cement slab, something like that. So good signs to look for if you suddenly find a hole um, in, in right along your, your deck or shed. Generally, it would be started by a woodchuck, maybe a rabbit, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. And then other things might go in and follow those in. Um, so the, the skunk or the fox. Um, so look for those kinds of things in your yard. Uh, the only rabbit in our area is the eastern cottontail. If you go further north, we have the snowshoe hare. If you go further west, there's the jackrabbit. The eastern cottontail is, is our rabbit here. Um, Again, it's a raider of gardens. It's an herbivore. Um, so a lot of people don't like it for that reason. Um, they are active mostly dawn and dusk. Uh, during the heat of the midday, they will lie out in the shade. Um, they will also go under the decks and the sheds. Sometimes they're the, just like a woodchuck, they're the first to make that hole underneath. Um, they are pretty prolific. They do breed like rabbits, um, but they have a very high mortality. Most of those young rabbits don't make it to their first age. If they do make it to one year old, they generally don't make it two or three years. Um, so uh, they are a prey species. Uh, so a lot of predators do go after them. So just to clarify there, so most rabbits are like two or younger that you'd see. Just generally, like yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I put that quote in there, those bunnies are not abandoned. One big thing about uh, the rabbits is the doe, the mother, will leave the bunnies, the young rabbits, in the nest during the day and not go to the nest. It's a way to avoid attracting predators to that nest. She will make a scrape, sometimes right in the middle of a, of a mowed lawn, uh, a scrape down into the ground. She'll line it with a lot of her fur. The, the bunnies will be in there. So someone will go out to work in their yard during the day. <gasps> There's a bunch of bunnies, no mother. They automatically think they're abandoned. They'll call. Um, so many times during the year, I have to answer this. Uh, that they aren't abandoned, leave them alone. The, the doe is nearby. She'll come back after dark and deal with them. If she doesn't like that the nest was disturbed, most likely she will move them. Um, but if you just wait, um, they will be gone pretty soon. The, the young rabbits, the bunnies actually leave the nest at very, when they're still very tiny. If their ears are upright, they've essentially gotten to the age where they can leave the nest. Again, it's a way to avoid predators. The faster you get out of the nest, the more chance you're going to survive. So, so uh, leave them alone unless they've been injured. They've been hit by the lawnmower, or the dog got them, or something like that. Um, uh, just leave the nest alone, pack them back in, and the doe will come back at night and, and move them. So. They do a lot of damage. Um, they're herbivores, again, during summer months, there's lots of plant material. During the winter, though, uh, there's a lot of dried material that they might eat, but they also will chew on the bark of shrubs in small trees too. So they can do a lot of damage. This is typical rabbit chewing here in this picture. Um, if it's all the way around, they could girdle the, the, the uh, tree and kill it. Um, so wrapping those uh, sensitive plants in the fall goes a long way to keeping uh, the rabbits from chewing on it. <clears throat> Something else to choose on a lot of our plants are the white-tailed deer. Um, here's another big success story. How are they even living in our cities? Um, it's amazing that they can. We've One thing, we've taken away their predators, um, the cougar especially, or the black bear. 
Um, there's not really much else that's going to hunt a deer here, um, but uh, they find plenty of food, uh, lots of cultivated plants. They actually love cultivated plants probably more than the native plants. Some native plants might have some toxins in them that they don't like, um, and they avoid those and go after the cultivated. So um, one way to, to deal with them is again, fencing, keeping them away from, from uh, the plants that are really sensitive. Um, so it's the buck on the left with the big antlers and the doe on the right. Um, and then the fawn is the little inset picture. Uh, we do periodically get calls for that abandoned fawn. Again, just like the bunnies, the doe deer will leave the fawn in place and go off and feed and not uh, bring the fawn around with her while she's eating. So somebody is out and about and stumbles upon a fawn laying like this in the grass, and it could be right in the middle of the yard. Um, sometimes it's in, in a little more sheltered space, but I have been called out and there was a fawn curled up right in the backyard, right in the middle of the yard. Um, again, the doe is nearby. She will come get the fawn when she is ready. So um, the best thing to do is leave it alone until that happens. Um, they will have uh, one to three young. Twins aren't um, that uncommon in our area. There's plenty of food for the doe. Um, and so she can support twins pretty well. Um, they're active, uh, most likely uh, dawn and dusk there. You will find their beds sometimes in wooded areas in the winter. You'll see these oval depressions in the snow, um, and that's where they've been sleeping, down in the, in the snow. That Some of the signs of the deer, um, they will come along and they will snip the buds or the young shoots. Um, in a way, in a natural way, it's sort of pruning shrubs and those kinds of things. So in a natural setting, it doesn't affect that. But for somebody's expensive cultivated shrub, they obviously aren't going to like that happen. But if you see little tips of your shrubs or little trees snipped off like this at an angle, um, it's probably a deer uh, just feeding. The picture on the right, though, is from the buck in the fall during the rut season, at the start of mating season, um, he begins to rub things, to mark his territory, to rub the skin or the velvet off of his bony antlers. Um, and he can actually shred trees that way. Um, they can again, girdle the tree and kill the tree. Um, I had been called out on signs like this where somebody thought they had a cougar scratching the tree. Um, if a cat scratches something like a cougar, they'll only scratch downward. Um, if you can see in this picture, they're shredding the top and the bottom of that, of that marked area. So that's from the buck rubbing his antlers up and down. Um, and there's lots of little bony protrusions on those antlers that are ripping into the bark. So that's a way to tell you've got a buck out there. Um, in my yard, I actually in the fall put up lots of fencing around the shrubs. I don't want the buck uh, to destroy during the rut. Um, so, um, and it does keep them away. I learned it the hard way. So they went out because it can happen in one night. And um, after that, I started putting up fencing to keep them out. Um, the smallest of our mammals here are the bats. Um, again, another very much maligned animal. Um, a lot of people don't like bats. Um, they think they're all evil and that they're all going out to bite us. And again, wildlife is not around here is not out to bite us. They don't want to be around us. They will try to get away from us. Um, we have nine species of bats. Most likely people are only really going to encounter the little brown bat or the big brown bat. Um, those are the most likely to hang out around our things. In the evenings, like a warm evening like this, just around dusk, you can look up against the lighter sky and you can see the bats flying around. All nine of our species of bats are insect eaters, insectivorous, um, and they will eat lots of insects, um, including mosquitoes. So um, it is a good check on uh, maybe an overpopulation of certain insects. Um, they are those suffering because insect populations on the whole are down throughout the world, really. Um, so uh, bats that are only eating insects are, are beginning to suffer because of that too. Um, but we still say that they, especially in certain areas, are very good at controlling something we don't like, which are the mosquitoes. Um, they invest in one young per year. They put a lot of effort into the one young. Um, it will stay with the mother for months, riding on her until it can learn to fly. Um, they cannot find food in the winter, so they either migrate out of here or hibernate. The brown bats especially will hibernate. They'll find a crack, 
or a tree cavity or something like that to get into in the fall and spend the whole winter. Um, sometimes though it happens, they find that crack or some kind of opening on a building. They go into hibernation and sometime during the winter, warm air gets out to them, wakes them up. They follow the warm air and suddenly it's the middle of January. And when a bat should be hibernating, it's now flying around inside a house. Um, bats uh, can carry rabies. The most likely carriers of rabies virus in our area are skunks or bats. It does not mean they all have it, but if it's around, it most likely will be found in one of those two species. Bats can actually carry it and not be affected by it for quite a long time until something else affects their immune system and then they become um, affected by it, but they can transmit it. Um, again, they're not going to go on the offensive and try to bite, but if one is found in a house, uh, we will respond and try to catch it. And we will ask the people in the house, did anybody touch it? Did anybody wake up and find it or go into a room where somebody was sleeping or somehow incapacitated and there was a bat? We do have to consider those as exposures and we have to catch the bat and take it to the testing lab at the University in St. Paul, um, just in case. Um, bats have tiny little teeth. They can break the skin enough to uh, transmit rabies, but you may not even know you've been bitten. Um, so certainly if you encounter it and want to try getting it out of your house yourself, wear gloves, use a net is, is the preferred method. Um, if not, you can call us and we'll come over and try to, to get it. So, but they're, again, they're another species that is, is part of our ecosystem and very important for that. Um, so moving on to birds real quickly. Um, I didn't want to go through all the species of birds that we have. We have hundreds. Um, I actually have a list of birds of about 105 species just at Bassett Creek Park alone um, that I've seen heard over the years. So we do have a, a pretty good um, uh, population of birds, some that nest, some here, some that just migrate through. Um, we were just talking earlier about Canada geese. Um, that's a big comeback. 60 years ago, you couldn't find a goose in our area. They were being imported. Now, a lot of people consider them pests because they do produce a lot of feces um, on our parks. So um, um, let's see, woodpeckers, uh, I get a lot of calls of woodpeckers on wood siding, making holes in wood siding. Uh, there are ways to scare them away. Um, sometimes it actually indicates you have an insect issue too, because they're finding insects under that. Um, so, um, and then finally, the last group would be reptiles. Um, Around here, it'd be mainly the painted turtle on the left, the snapping turtle, the upper right, and then the garter snake. Um, this is the midst of, of turtle nesting season right now. They're up and about. The females have to leave the water and go up to what they feel is above the high water mark to dig a nest and lay their eggs. The eggs have to stay above water. They can't drown. Um, so they will be up and about. I get a lot of calls of a big snapping turtle suddenly in somebody's yard. And again, everybody thinks something bad's going to happen, but all she's up doing is trying to lay her eggs. So if we just leave her alone, she'll do that and go back to the waterway um, from where she came. Um, garter snakes, we do still occasionally see them around. Uh, a lot of our development has, has um, um, taken away their habitat, but they do occasionally pop up. I have had a couple of calls over the years where they've gotten into a house Generally, that would indicate you have some big cracks in your foundation because they're coming down from, from underground um, and coming into your house that way. So, but that would be our most common snake around here, the garter snake. So those are all um, the animals around here. So what do we do when we encounter these things? Um, when I get a call, sometimes people are just frantic. Um, they see something or they've heard something or something's in their house. Um, the first thing I try to do is calm them down. The animal doesn't really want to engage us. It wants to get away from us. So um, I'll try to find out what kind of species it is and find out what it's doing. Um, I'll go out to the property and, and give them some advice on what to do. I will try to, to educate them on, on what the animals are looking for. And their main thing are basics, food and shelter. They want to eat everything they can. They want to uh, nest or burrow into a safe place. They want a nice safe place for their young. Um, so keeping them from those things are the, really the best long-term solution. And the best thing you could do if you put up a deck or a shed is to put up some kind of exclusion fencing. 
Um, that is a wire, heavy gauge wire mesh, upright covering the space and then buried in the ground. And you can see the part that's flat on the ground will be buried back over. Again, animals that dig tend to dig right up against something. So right at the base of that shattered deck. If they dig down and they encounter this wire mesh flat on the ground, they're not gonna be able to dig through it. They'll move on. They won't wanna do it. They don't know there's an outer edge to it as long as it stays buried. Um, if you don't like the look of it, then you can cover it over with the wood trellis. But a lot of people just go for the wood trellis first and that's easily breached. A, ra a rabbit can chew through the wood trellis within moments and get in under the deck. Um, so um, there's a little bit of wood trellis on the left side of that. You can actually then put that over what you might consider as the ugly uh, exclusion fencing. Um, and what I mean by the best kind of stuff is hardware cloth on the left or chicken wire. Most people know what chicken wire is. Um, it, it, the cheaper stuff comes in the one inch mesh size. There's smaller mesh size, heavier gauge, or there's hardware cloth, which is heavier gauge and, and a quarter mesh. Uh, if you put hardware cloth up and, and seal all the edges, you'll actually keep out chipmunks and mice as well too. So chicken wire is great for the big stuff. Hardware cloth will cover everything else. So um, look for that at, the, at any of the hardware stores and put that in. Um, and then next are food sources, all kinds of things. Again, these animals are looking for anything they can. So compost, uh, bird feeders, garbage day. You can see the crows actually have learned what garbage day is. Um, but uh, raccoons will also get into those cans. The upper right picture is actually going out and feeding wildlife. Um, and I noticed over by the unique thrift store that there was always a flock of ring-billed gulls hanging out in the parking lot. And I always wondered why. It's kind of a big open space. They like those kinds of places. And then I started noticing this pile of stuff that somebody was leaving and the, the gulls were eating it. And I realized it was cooked rice. So that pile of white right there is a whole Tupperware container of white rice that mm. was cooked and somebody, I actually found the, caught, I waited and caught them doing it. They uh, drove up and just dumped the rice on the ground and drove away. You know, they like to watch, they wanted to feed the gulls. Um, and I just explained to them, it probably isn't the best thing to make them congregate in a parking lot where they're gonna get hit um, or cause other trouble. Um, um, so I just asked them, maybe we shouldn't do that in this parking lot here. So, um, but all kinds of things uh, can be food sources for, for these animals. Uh, some other tips real quick, uh, something in the chimney. Um, if the damper is closed in the chimney, that animal is not going to do damage in the chimney. So there's not any big rush to get them out. The big thing is don't start a fire. Everybody thinks I'll just smoke them out of there. Uh, what might actually happen is you kill them uh, because of the smoke and now you've got to deal with their body in there. The best thing to do, they like it because it's dark and quiet. So change that, put lights in the fireplace, put a radio tuned to a talk station as loud as you can stand and listen to talk station. Um, and as long as that animal can go back up the chimney, like a raccoon can, or maybe a squirrel, then they will go out. The mom raccoon will take the young because she doesn't like it in there anymore and go elsewhere. If it's something that can't go back up, like a bird, and I've pulled lots of species of birds out of chimneys, um, I can come over and try to figure out what it is. I will reach up and try to grab it if I think it's not going to bite me. Um, so, um, but for the most part, uh, try the radio and talk station first and see how that does. Um, they're getting up on the, in the chimney because they can get on the roof. They can climb a tree that's right next to the house. So trim those back um, so they can't get up on your roof. Even if they can't get into the chimney, they'll still go on the roof to look around. It's still a neat place to go explore. Um, they're always looking for opportunities. Um, if you do put out bird feeders, put up baffles that the squirrels can't and the raccoons can't climb up and keep the feeders six feet away from anything they can jump from because they're excellent jumpers. And then finally use humane scare tactics. You can just chase them. You can throw things towards them. There are balloons, there's mylar tape you can hang. There's, uh, you know, there, uh, there's a, um, something you can put on your, your garden hose that's motion activated that will suddenly start shooting water at them. Um, so all these things tend to work. Um, this was taken from a book uh, published by the Humane Society of the United States. It's a great all over uh, illustration of someone's house and what you can do around it. So caps on the chimney and the vents, 
Um, there's mylar tape at the eaves to keep woodpeckers away. There's cover over your window wells. I pull a lot of things out of egress windows, so keep those covered. Um, um, make it so you can still get out in an emergency. That's what the egress window is for, but so things can't fall down. Um, get that uh, the L-shaped exclusion fencing up around the deck, put up fencing around your, your gardens. Um, so lots of things you could do around the house. And it doesn't take that long. It's the long-term solution. Um, what a lot of people like to do is trap them. They see an issue, they think, well, the best thing I can do is trap this animal out of here. Um, and there are very, the various reasons why trapping should, A, not be the first thing to go to, and B, not be the thing to go to at all. Trapping is only suitable if it's in your house and you can't get it out any other way. You can trap it in the house and let it go outside after you fix the hole that it got in. Um, so for humane reasons, if you consider you're just grabbed, you're caught in a trap and you're suddenly dumped somewhere you've never been before. You don't know where there's food, you don't know where there's shelter, you suddenly have to fight the residents to get to those resources, you're probably gonna try to leave. Um, so if you just trap an animal and dump it somewhere, most likely that animal's going to die. Um, either it won't find the resources it needs or it'll try to leave and it'll get hit by a car. Um, so uh, trapping is, is not good. It also is illegal to go to just any old property and, and dump that trapped animal. And that includes a government property like a park, wildlife management area, wildlife refuge, um, anything like that. So it doesn't really get to the root of the issue is that they had an access, they had access to something, food or shelter. So if you just remove this individual and don't do anything what, about what it was doing, another one's gonna take advantage of that. So I always say, go right to the root of the issue, put up that exclusion fencing, remove that food source, and that will be solving the, uh, the issue long-term and get those animals out of there. So, uh, sorry, I went over a little bit. Um, yeah, they don't always do what we want. They don't follow the crosswalk when we want them to. They, they, they have their own lives to live. I think we do need to be a little more tolerant of them because they are here to stay and they do um, uh, deserve to exist. We put up so many barriers for these animals with our things, our curb and gutters and our storm sewers, our reflective windows that birds will fly into that um, I think it's important that we help them as best we can. Um, but you can certainly do things. Uh, if you don't want them in your yard, there are plenty of things you can do to keep them out. So I'm willing to come out to a property um, and look around, tell you what things you can do if you'd like. Um, you can give me a call or an email. Um, that's my office number. If something is happening and you really need to speak to an officer right then, the call or dispatch, Say you see an injured animal or uh, something uh, went on, your dog got into it with some animal or something like that, do call dispatch. You can use 911 in our area. That number, the 10 digit number that's on the screen is their non-emergency number that you can call for dispatch. And somebody will get sent out as soon as possible. So thanks a lot for having me and I'll take any questions if you have it. Have any. any questions from the- What kind of plants and coyotes? What kind of what? Kind of plants. Uh, they will eat seeds. They will eat fruits if they can get them. It's not a major part of their diet, but but they will take advantage of it if they can find them. Yeah. What's your most frequent um, wild animal call? Um, in in general, it's there's something in my yard and I don't want it in my yard. Um, and so come and take it away. Um, unfortunately, that's it. So um, I will go through the whole thing of why it want, what it is and why it wants to be there. And this is what you can do to change that. Uh, but what we don't come out is and come out and do is put up traps and take away everything. Again, I don't have any um, permission to go somewhere and let these animals go either. Um, and it doesn't really solve the issue. So uh, in general, it's that. Gen more specifically for species, it would be uh, the rabbits and the squirrels and the raccoons. Okay. Yeah. So um, you say issue when there's like an animal in the yard. I guess it's an issue if you, if the owner of the property thinks it's an issue, right? Correct. Like, yes. Yep. So like, it's not like we're inviting wild animals uh, intentionally. I guess we kind of are by building a deck, right? It's inviting. Right. Here's a shelter. Right. Plant. So it's not. 
do we have an obligation to like not like to put the exclusion fence up or is it fine to not like in terms of I mean if you don't mind having rabbits under your deck yeah if you don't mind the animals being there don't okay don't change anything like that there's no law that says we have to put up exclusion fencing right, essentially. Right, right. and I can go into a yard and tell them you know put up this exclusion fencing but I can look in all the neighboring yards and see decks and sheds that are wide open for the animals too so if if the whole neighborhood doesn't like these animals being around, if everybody did the exclusion fencing, there would be fewer places for them yeah, to live. Yeah. 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 And I think it's just a, a factor that people don't understand what's happening when they do something. You know, they don't think about, a lot of people don't think about wildlife until they're actually living under the deck, you know, or they smell that skunk or something like that. So like if I have chipmunks, for instance, uh, living under my porch, like, are they going to cause a problem? Somehow, are they going to make us sick or get into our house? Well, if they're just under the porch, I mean, they can't get into the house except through maybe the dryer vent or a door that's left open. They, they're not going to go through the foundation and get in, but they could maybe figure out another way. I have caught plenty of chipmunks running around homes, and it's always because they got in some opening that, that should have been blocked off or closed. I, my kids just got in the door open. Mm -hmm. And we get chipmunks. Yeah, I have a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're digging. You know, so will I they? Can chase it out, right? I can just chase it. Out. You can just chase it out. Yep, and it goes right back outside. So I mean, would digging under the under a concrete block do enough to destabilize that block? I don't know. It's probably not going to happen. A lot of people don't like the blemish of the hole next to their concrete block where. You know, the rest of the lawn is all manicured. There's a hole and they don't like that. Actually, uh, to think about but, that more, I'd say the bigger issue would be if water got if in. water got there, down there, yeah. Next to your foundation and then potentially seeped in, that would be probably a sequence. Mm -hmm. concern. Yeah. So probably something like that. What works really well is that um, ammonia-soaked rag. I, I said it's a good way to, to throw off the raccoon latrine. Um, it's also a good uh, thing to put down a hole uh, because the fumes will bother them just like they bother us, and they won't want to be around it. And the rags are mainly to keep the ammonia from um, soaking into the soil or evaporating too fast. So you soak the rags and you put them down the hole. Looks like Blocker's so. got a question online. You want to unmute? Yeah, thanks, Terry. Uh, yeah. I was just curious, Tom, have you encountered many examples of squirrel mange or other animals with mange in the area before? Sure, yeah. The, um, the animal we see mange in the most is a red fox. Um, and sometimes it can go through a, much of the population. Um, and it can lead to, uh, well, it could lead to them looking pretty bad, but it can lead to them eventually becoming blind. Um, and at that point, they won't be able to find food, so then they begin to starve. Um, so people can call. Um, and we'll try to catch them. Um, I, if I can walk right up to them and catch them in a net, excuse me, I will take them to the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center where they'll try to treat the mange um, um, if they can. So, but yes, yeah, I haven't seen squirrels with it too badly. It's mostly been in fox population. I believe it's sarcoptic mange, which is, which is a mite. Well, thank you. This has been sure. very informative. Do we have any other questions or? Okay. All right. Great. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Yep. Thank you. And we